Good morning. It feels like Friday in here, right? Today we're going to review briefly the few changes that I made to the class websites and the content that I added, the assignments. Then, as planned, we're going to see a few more scenes from Little Caesar. I will reintroduce the movie for anyone who has forgotten or was not here the last time. I will place under your attention the focal points about three of the main characters in the film. And at the end, I would like to hear your opinion about whether or not this film, its characters, can be considered Machiavellian and why. Okay. Now, as you see here, this is the first written assignment. I just put it in the, on the board because I want to remind you that the original deadline for this assignment called Is a Con a Machiavellian Game was tonight. However, it was then changed to Monday, February 21st, of course, by the end of the day, because I only got to talk about this and provide a substantial example of the kind of work that you need to do on Wednesday, so I thought I would give more time. And I'm saying that also because I myself introduced some confusion because on Wednesday I spoke about today, Friday, as the deadline when in fact it had already been changed, okay? Of course, if you need any help with this, let me know via email or of course you can ask me now or Monday. As promised, I added at the end of this week two additional readings to be done online. The original reading is what you find under 1A, which is more chapters from the Prince, because on Monday we will continue with the analysis of chapters 3 through 5 of the Prince. I added some pages from Robert Greene's The 48 Laws of Power, and we will spend Wednesday's class talking about it. And I added pages of a chapter from a book called American Gangster Cinema, where you will find a short section about Little Caesar. Now, I uploaded the whole first chapter because it wasn't easy otherwise to cut out just the first section, but really what you should focus out of that first chapter which is almost 30 pages, what you should focus on are pages 5 through 16, which is the chapter, the, the section rather, devoted to Little Caesar. Of course, it does start with reference to narrative tensions that have been introduced in the previous paragraph. So if you want to go back a little bit, or if you're curious to know more and you want to advance, that's fine, but those are the pages for you to follow. Keep in mind that both of these documents are PDF documents. They reside on Google Drive and you'll need your Stony Brook login to access so that access is limited to the people of this class. If you have any trouble accessing the documents, just let me know, but I tested both links and they did work on my side once I was signed in into the Stony Brook system. As you see below, I also added a second weekend assignment that has to do with 48 laws of power. You find in here a long description, but I'd rather talk about this on Wednesday during the class that will be devoted to that book because there is plenty of time. As you will see at the end of the instructions, 
This is due March 4th. So have a look at this. Think of questions you want to ask next week, but we'll review it together next week. So, a short recap and a new introduction to the movie Little Caesar. Little Caesar is a talkie from 1931 that established some of the parameters of the gangster movie genre. It focuses on a series of criminals that operate in the city of Chicago, but central to the development of the narrative in this film are three characters. And everyone else around is just allies and antagonists. People who support these three characters or people who oppose their movements, actions, their ascents in the world of criminality. Of course, the absolute protagonist is the man of the title, Enrico Cesare Enrico Bandello, known as Rico. And of course, you know that the movie is so famous that in the 1970s, when the United States introduced legislation and articles in the penal code for organized crime to convict members of organ criminal organizations and to increase their punishment based on the fact that they're not just regular criminals, that their allegiance to uh, uh, a criminal organization makes them more formidable criminals, they call that law the RICO law. And, and they made RICO into a, an acronym, but that was a homage, that was a reference to this very famous character. So we find Rico, we find his friend Joe, and then we will focus on Frank, because Frank doesn't have a lot of scenes, but he has one significant scene, which is the first one we will see, and has a, a thematic role that is equally relevant. Rico, Joe, and Frank represent <clears throat> three stages of criminality. As we said, Rico is the unrepentant criminal who will be eventually punished, who will perish without having a chance to really be reintegrated in society or experiences re experiencing remorse for his action. And as you will see, his famous last line, when he's dying, is on the ground. He has been shot with a Tommy machine gun, which is very typical of the movies, the gangster movies from the 1930s. His famous last line is, is this the end of Rico? Right? <laughs> because of course, all his life has been dreaming of a, a big, uh, uh, culmination to his life and instead he's dying alone on the ground uh, in, in a dramatic fashion. Now, Rico, we found at the beginning of the movie in a town that was too small for his ambitions, then moves, he then moves to Chicago exactly to support a larger better career in the criminal world. What are Rico's qualities, characteristics? Well, first of all, what moves this character is greed. So his punishment is punishment for clearly this first and basic sin of greed. And this is rendered in a very material way in the film. There is a whole scene in the middle of the movie that I will not include in today's viewing because we don't have enough time. But during this scene, 
a banquet is organized within a club, which is just a front for a criminal gang, at this banquet, there is a program, there is a printed out program with Bandello's name. People are sitting around a U-shaped table, and at the very center, there is uh, Rico. And they give him gifts, a ring with a gem, and a watch, a pocket watch, and the crown of the face of the watch is all made of little diamonds, little shiny gems. And several times at the end of this scene, you see Rico watching, looking at the watch, looking at the reflections of the gems, looking at the ring on his finger. So clearly, he is attracted in a very primitive, in a very naive, almost animalesque way to shiny object. What we learn from the scene of the band, and also from conversations between Rico and Joe, is that the other thing that moves Rico, that motivates his actions and criminal activities, is his desire for visibility. And of course, this as well is a sin because it, it's not the honest man plan to become visible because of their merits, because they deserve to be brought up in society placed at the attention of society. Visibility for Rico means that he wants to be the point of reference for the organization. He wants to replace San Vittori and be at the center of attention. Then, and he will manage to do that through the crime that we saw last Friday when they robbed the nightclub which was placed under the protection of another boss, criminal boss, by the name of Adney. Then, to increase its visibility, Rico will plot to replace and manage to replace Pitt Montana. And finally, when he dies, we already know of his plans to replace the, the big boy, the, the head of the mafia organization for which uh, Rico has been working. Finally, we can say that altogether the problem, the last problem, the last scene for which Rico is being punished to teach a lesson to everyone watching the movie is meanness. That is to say, we noticed, you may have noticed, that the way the character is being played by Edward G. Robinson conveys the idea that this character is naturally mean, is naturally predisposed to violence, to cruelty, and to generally be mean to everyone around him. From his best friend Joe, although Joe is somewhat shielded from the consequences of his action for his lukewarm collaboration and support. And as you will see, at some point, Rico will have the opportunity to kill, to shoot, to eliminate Joe, to prevent him from snitching to the police. And because of their friendship, he will not do that. He will not find it. Courage. But in general, you can say that Rico is quite mean. What about Joe? Joe is Rico's friend, and we know that Joe moves to Chicago with Rico, but it doesn't move there just to engage in larger scale crimes. He also goes there to pursue his dream of an alternative lifestyle based on 
his lifelong desire and talent, which is dancing. So Joe is a criminal, right? But rather than mention the motivations, rather than showing that he wants to get richer or that he's violent, his criminality has to be placed within a different kind of context, which of course you recognize because these are basic ploys of morality, of a morality tale. So instead of putting greed there, we'll put bad companies. Because Joe doesn't seem to be a hard criminal in his core. However, we know we see him from the very beginning in the company of Rico, and we can deduct, we can guess from that, that being in the company of people like Rico led him astray in society, right? And we know that Joe is the character who will find redemption, right? Who will get out of the criminal world and be integrated in society as a model citizen and a successful one, right? So the kind of visibility that Rico was looking for in the negative, in the negative side, exploring the dark side of society, that visibility will be gained in a very prominent evident way by Joe because at the end of the movie when Rico is dying we see in the outside of the building where Rico is dying we see the advertising big poster advertising the show of Joe and his companion Olga where they're dancing so they become visible in a positive way they become rich and successful by applying their talents and work Okay, so uh, besides mentioning that he is, that Joe is affected, is influenced initially by that company, we have to list the elements of his redemption. One is work, because he works at a desk and he finds an honest job, an honest employment, his spending time, right, rather than applying his time committing his time to criminal activities. We find him late because he's working. He's working on the stage, he's training, rehearsing, etc. And of course you find a wife or a woman next to him who makes an honest man out of him, right? And you'll see that she plays a big role in persuading Joe to talk to the police and denounce the criminal activities of Rico, and that, that's an important part. As far as Frank is concerned, from the very first scene that we'll see today, we find that he was a good boy. He was an altar boy. He has a doting mother. So he has a family. However, even in this case, the positive influence of the family, of the community, is being contrasted by the fact that he gets meshed, enmeshed in this criminal gang. And of course, he is not bad. He's not a bad guy. Is not bad in his core. The core of Frank is being an altar boy, being his mother's good boy, right? But he cannot find redemption. We will see that he will be killed on the steps of a church where he's going to get encouragement and good advice from the same priest that he helped as an altar boy when he was a kid, so it's too late for him. However, he is good, basically a good guy. That's what we learned. How do we see this? 
because the same way that we see visibly on their faces, we see the meanness of Rico, his eyes, his grimace, the way he talks, we see that Frank, from the moment he appears engaged in criminal activity as the driver of the gateway car after the robbery of the nightclub, we see him rattled. We see him struggling with remorse, with conscience. He cannot get himself to drive quickly enough and, and run away from the place of the crime. Enrico has to smack him. And then we find him trying to get the cart of the crime out of their area and not being able to because he's so nervous that he crashes into a pole and then he has to walk away on foot. So we see someone who might have been returned to society, to a positive contribution to society, but fails because sometimes if you uh, get mixed with bad apples, bad people, then it might be too late to save you. Okay, so the movie is modeling these different kind of paths. The descending path, a descent into hell of Rico, the successful attempt by Joe to be reintegrated in society through work and a regular stable relationship, and Frank being soft, a good boy, but soft and influenced by bad company, and ultimately losing his life and his soul. So this is the scene right after the robbery between Frank and his mother, Tony, sorry, and his mother. I could cry, it sh should have been Tony. <laughs> I, I don't know why, maybe because Frank and Tony are, are common names in the Italian-American community. So I don't know where Frank came, and no one told me, right? No one told me here, please. If I say things that don't make sense, please tell me, okay? The Paisan names can sound alike. Hmm? Paisan names can sound alike. Yeah, maybe. They gotta stick together. There's a rope around my neck right now, they only hang it once. If anybody turns you on and squeals, my gun's gonna speak at speed. Eat something is the answer all Italian mothers have to everything. Remember them when you're in the quietest, The next thing is drink something. Yes. Remember? Father McNeil. The church was beautiful. You little boy with long hair. The tall, big candle. The loud. And then you compare this mother to Rico's mother, who's like a witch. Go down to you. Can't you stay at all, I would. 
Please don't go away. Please. Oh, God, don't be honest. I don't know. 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 I Take good care of yourself, would you, huh? Take your butt up to this bad chair, would you, huh? In the Italian community, you have more than one mother. Your neighbor can become your second mother or your second grandmother. See, see, he's good. He's good at his core. And you see him there in a social setting. Will he be able to be reintegrated in this kind of society? Hey, what? Where you been? I'm looking all over for you. People want you to come and get your split. What's the matter, Tony? Don't you want to split? Are you crazy? I'm not crazy. I don't want no split. Listen, Tony. Rico knows you'll lose your nerve. But he wants you to be a man. You better not turn yellow. Get away from me, O'Tara. Leave me alone. Listen, kid, I'm trying to put it for your own good. Now you come with me and get your job. Uh. Hey, Tony! Tony, where are you going? I'm going to see Bob McNeil. Not good. I found Tony, but it's too late. He's crazy, crazy. I tell him to be a man, but he just shake his head and go to the priest. Well, I guess that's that. We ain't got any time to lose. Come on, son, get yourself a car and let's go. Bossy! Take, take care. No, I'm scared. No, I ain't no good. That's in the drive, O'Carroll? Sure. All right, let's go. We'll use a back roadster. There we are. It's kind of dark, but you see the church. There is the end of Puertoni. Followed by a funeral, of course, and you'll find several funerals in gangster movies of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, including The Godfather, because that's when you reflect on what kind of life is the criminal life. And also you can see the double faces of people, those who were responsible for your, mur your own murder, had to show up at the funeral because there is an intricate relationship between mafia, criminal activities, and society. So you don't kill someone and then disappear or hide, you kill someone and then you show up at the funeral, right? And maybe the people around or some of the people around know that you were responsible, but it's all right, you have to be there no matter what. So we'll skip this and follow the career of Rico. So at this point, Rico, Rico has managed to, well, he was the victim of an attack himself. The man of Arni, the boss who was protecting the nightclub that Rico robbed, tried to kill Rico. They just wounded him very likely at a shoulder. And then Rico managed to defeat Arni and force him to leave town to go to Detroit and so to abandon his area of criminal control to him. And then we see Rico coming closer and closer to the top of the criminal organization and therefore the triumphal culmination of his career based on violence, deceit, meanness, 
in general. There will be another encounter with Joe, but we'll see during the last part of the movie how Joe is trying and manages successfully to get out of the criminal world. Little Caesar.